For anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Ida Moore, I'll be talking today. I'm fairly new at the DC, so I'm very thankful to have this opportunity to share something with you guys. This is my specialty business. I'm sure you guys are a little bit better than me, a lot of people in the room. It's something I feel of value that I can share with the community, so I'm very happy to do that. All right, so let's start. Lessons from the Special Forces in International Counterterrorism. Principles and Tactics for Business Owners. So what do you can expect from me today? First off, I get a little bit intense. All right, especially when I talk about this stuff, I get a little bit intense and I also get very, very real. I am not trying to be harsh, I am trying to be truthful and blunt because one of the biggest lessons we learn is that there's no room for fluff and for extra things in the battlefield. Okay, you gotta be very straight, you gotta be very direct. I'll try to soften it down for the community, I recognize that, but please if I say something that sounds a little bit harsh, it's not because I'm trying to talk down to you, it's because I'm trying to be real and saying you can build up to this level, but this is the reality of it. Okay? What I ask from you guys is to focus, all right? This is going to be pretty quick. There's nothing you're going to have to take videos of or pictures of. I'm going to be sending you guys every, all the good stuff. I'm going to be sending it to your email afterwards. So please put your phones on airplane mode. I would really appreciate it. The second thing I ask is to ask questions, okay? My goal here today is not to be up here as an expert, okay? I'm not a guru. I don't have anything to sell. This is just something I want to give to you. So the more questions you ask of me, I can make sure you're understanding these things and you're getting value out of them, right? The third thing is challenge me. Again, my goal here is not to just say, I know this, this is what it is. As a team right now, my mission is to lead everybody into learning these new principles. So if you think there's something better out there that I'm not getting, let me know and share with the group and that way we can all just grow together and get bigger. Sound good? Yeah. All right. So let's start with a quote. The supreme accomplishment of the warrior is to perform the commonplace under far from common conditions. King Leonidas said this. Anybody seen the movie 300 here? All right, that was actually a true story. And if anybody has not read the book, The Hot Gates, I really recommend you do it. The movie just does entirely injustice to that film, okay? To the book, sorry. This was actually there at the Battle of Thermopylae at the Hot Gates. And this is really what I want to talk about today, okay? so. Whatever strategies we may have, they don't matter if you can't execute when it counts, right? In a time of crisis, if you can't actually perform when things are tough, it doesn't matter how technically good you are. And that was the biggest takeaway I got from the Special Forces, an ability to remain calm when things are calm. So this is what I want you guys to learn today, how to stay calm during crisis. In order to do that, we're gonna learn a little bit about how to build mental fortitude. Because this is a tool that you will be able to use that if you know you have the toughness in you and you have the ability to overcome, situations won't stress you because you're like, you know what? I got this. I'm the kind of person that can overcome. We're going to talk about making effective decisions through mental modules. Okay, this is going to be a more practical application of how to actually do this, something you can take away with. And we're going to be doing three practice exercises with these mental modules towards the end of the talk, so you can take something substantial away from here today, use it for the conference, use it for your life, use it for your business. Sound good? Yeah. Yep. All right. So why should you listen to me? Now, I'm going to say my resume for a second, but I want to make it very clear. This is not to impress anyone. It's to impress upon you that I have probably been in very challenging situations in my life, chaotic situations, and I've probably learned some valuable lessons along the way from having mentors in that area and just basically going through the grind, right? So, when I was 18, I was drafted into the Israeli Defense Force. I was drafted into the most elite unit in our special forces. So the elite of the elite of the elite. We were 12 people out of an entire age group of 18 year olds in Israel, okay? I was afterwards, when I was 21, I went into our Shin Bet, which is our version, FBI, CIA, MI5, MI6, whatever it may mean to you. Um, to anyone who's wondering, I was not a spy. I get asked that a lot. I did, however, work in counterterrorism and counterespionage abroad in several undercover positions. And I was also the youngest air marshal in my country's history. So an air marshal, if anybody doesn't know, when 9-11 happened, that was because there were no air marshals on the plane. There was no one there to intervene, and if terrorists tried to take over, they would stop that situation. So that was my job. I would be undercover on planes, along with the team, and if any terrorists tried to kidnap Israeli airlines, we were there to intervene, make sure everybody got home safe. I'm also a jiu-jitsu black belt. I've uh, trained and competed all across the world. This is obviously not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
competed anywhere from local shows here in Asia to the World Championships in California, tournaments in Brazil. I was ranked top 10 in the world at the amateur levels for a little bit. And also, my last stint in this field of the world, I was the head of security and chief of security for a Russian oligarch. So basically, I was in charge for three years of making sure that him and his family were safe. During a worldwide tour, he was like, I made billions of dollars, I want to see the world just family, make sure everyone's safe. <laughs> so that was what I did. So it was making sure that him and his family got along everywhere and everyone was, soft, was fine, dealing with security customs, um, securing assets anywhere from villas in the south of France to half billion dollar mega yachts, and basically making sure that everything went well. So you might be asking, how did I get from here to here? <laughs> right? <laughs> so here's the thing, when I was doing that, um, when I was working with the boss, I really loved that at first. I was building SOPs, I was conducting risk assessments, I was doing all these very high level team building things and installing teams here and there and all that, things that I loved. But eventually, things kind of worked well and I became just a bodyguard for him and his family and he decided that I'm the person he trusts with his son, this little kid who was the golden goose and I ended up becoming a babysitter, I didn't like it. So this was me about a year and a half ago. <laughs> to this wonderful lady over there and I was like, I do not want to be working rotations or I go away in the world anymore. <laughs> Alright, so the specific takeaways you'll get today is one, how to achieve better outcomes under challenging circumstances, what we talked about. Okay, if this is where it counts, this is where you can succeed. Now why is this relevant to you guys? If you want to achieve something extraordinary in your business, in your life, you will inevitably face challenging circumstances. So. That could like really separate, that was great separation. If you can able to, if you're able to perform during those challenging circumstances when others aren't, you're gonna thrive, right? Again, I think this has the biggest overall and overarching effect. Period. In life, in business, in everything and anything. I think it's so important, and that's why out of all the lessons that I learned in the special forces, this is the one I really want to talk to you guys about today. That sound good? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, remember this sentence, I will say it throughout this talk several times. You will not rise to the occasion, you will fall to your lowest level of training. I'll say it again, you will not rise to the occasion, you will fall to your lowest level of training. And this is where I mean I'm not being harsh. I'm not saying you're going to fall. I'm saying that this is the reality of it, but you have the ability to rise to a magnificent level if you put in the necessary work. All right? So, this is me when I was 18, joined the Special Forces, still had my original hairline, which was great. Um, and basically the way Special Forces training goes in Israel, it's an 18 months training period, before, sorry, 20 months training period, before you're actually qualified as an operator. Until then, you're still considered a trainee, you do not go on missions, and their whole job is to basically harass you, in order to make you grow. They're trying to make you quit every time so you can see, wait, there's no limits to what I thought. Between months four to six, we have what's called special unit boot camp. This is their opportunity after you go through boot camp in the regular military, where there's a lot of laws and regulations that people have to follow, to take you somewhere where nobody sees, and be like, all right, now let's not give you any sleep. So basically, just imagine, envision yourself in this situation. It's two months. You have no idea what's going next, you're in complete fog, you don't know what the next exercise is, the next evolution is, you don't know if you're going home this weekend, you're going home next month, you're underfed, you're sleep deprived, everyone's grumpy, you're all shaved up from carrying around these vests all day, your feet are just one, just one giant blister, and you're just in a world of suck basically, all right? So, my story is as follows. On the last week of unit boot camp, when we were just about ready to finish the schooling phase, it was one of those nights and they were like, all right guys, it's raining, so you know what rain means? Get your stuff on, we're gonna go have some fun. So we put on our vest and we just started running. And around, I was always a bad runner. I had a really challenging time running long distances. I was really good at sprints, I was good at Krav Maga, but long distances just were not my thing. I'm not really built like a long distance runner. So at around the 10K mark, I had one of the officers come to me and he said, Are you alright? And I was like, Yeah, I'm okay. And he's like, You want to take a rest? 
And I was like, yeah, I gotta take a rest for a second. And he was like, all right, man, the truck's right there. And he walked me to the truck. That was the moment I got kicked out of my unit. That's the real shit. Like, that is the moment I got kicked out. I didn't even realize what was happening. I was just in a compromised state of mind. I was tired. I was hungry. My pulse was at 2,000. And I didn't realize I was quitting. Okay? Now, the thing that sucked was that about 10 minutes later, when they took me to the makeshift base we had in the middle of nowhere and told me, like, pack your stuff up and go, I immediately regretted it. Because my pulse was down. I had an ability to think a little bit more clearly. And it sucked. And this is a decision that haunts me like to this day. This is my first time sharing it in a room and I still like, feel ashamed of it, right? It's a sucky, sucky outcome. So why did I quit and fail? Like honestly, let me ask you this. Why do you guys think at that moment I quit and I failed? Exhausted. Exhausted. Sorry? You were focused on a little bit of where you were. Okay, what else? You didn't know your limits. What else? Boom. Okay. So, why do we make real-time decisions that go against our desired outcomes? Okay. We all know where we actually want to go to, but when things are involved, when it's a stressful situation, we do not make the right decisions. We hear he's made a bad decision, they regret it 10 minutes later. Exactly. All right. Now, I want to break this down into why this actually happens. Okay? There's three main elements in why we make bad decisions in real time. First of them is workload. Okay? Even if we have a very easy problem to solve, but we have a million of those to solve, it's going to fog us down, we're going to feel like it's piling on, it's going to start stressing us, right? Next one is stress. And these can be biological stressors. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I need a cup of coffee. They can be external stressors. That person in the coffee shop is playing YouTube way too loud. That baby's crying. I have money problems on my mind. This person, my client, is being a bit of an asshole, right? All these things can stress us out. And the last thing is the complexity of the task at hand. Now, this is a given, right? I don't need to explain why the more complex the task is, the more it might hinder our ability to actually perform. Now, this is challenging stuff, right? But there's also something pretty cool that can be done about it. Because all these detrimental factors that go into us making decisions are all negated if there's no time crunch. If a giant workload is time sensitive and we know that we have to get it done by tomorrow, we're going to feel stressed. But if we know that we can only finish it up 10 years from now, no worries. If my internal biological stressor that I'm hungry, that I'm tired, and I have to do something right now, they may affect me. But if I have to do it, the next week, I can rest, I can eat, I can recuperate, everything's fine. I can go away from the coffee shop where someone's playing their YouTube too loud, that annoying baby, I can relax. And obviously, if a task is very complex, I can just break it down into small little pieces and figure it out. There's no worries, right? When you're stressed, you'll make poor decisions that you'll regret. Right? This is like my classic example. Like I still regret that decision to this day. I had multiple stressors playing with me, and I made a bad decision. So I thought to myself, why did I do it? And this man I said right here, it's like, in life we usually have two routes. We take the easy route, and we take the more difficult route. Why do we choose to take the easier route? What year is it? 2019. Where do you think our brains evolved? <laughs> a couple million years ago. We choose the easier route because our brain is telling us something's terrifying you, there might be danger, and for our survival, we go away from it. There might be a tiger, there might be a lion trying to kill us. The reality is in 2019, in digital entrepreneurship, we're usually afraid because we're trying to do something really big and really fucking awesome. So that I can really recommend to you guys, if you're facing a thing where you think, I want to choose the easy one or the more difficult one, in real time, Choose the more difficult route. You'll rarely regret it. You'll rarely, rarely regret taking the more difficult route. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, so when I got kicked out of that unit, I had about a month at home before I got recruited back into the service. They were like, okay, you need time to kind of figure your shit out. And I got placed into another special forces unit. It wasn't the most elite of the elite, but it was still a pretty good unit. Still something I'm proud of. 
But I said to myself, how do I avoid making a decision that's going to cause me regret afterwards? How am I going to achieve my desired outcome? And I started thinking, okay, let me try to build this thing, and I didn't name it yet, but it's what I now call a mental model. And it's a very basic if, then, because plan that I had in my mind. So the because is because I want a certain outcome. I want to graduate. I want to become an operator. I want to succeed. If is a hard situation I may encounter. Then is what am I actually going to do about it in the heat of the moment. Okay, so if I get taken on a long ass run when I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm exhausted, everything, then I'm just going to persevere and I'm going to push through no matter what anyone tells me. Because I want to achieve my goal and I want to succeed. Now this is very simple, right? It's very simple, but it's very difficult and it's not easy to do in real time. But in the next unit, when I had the same situations happen again and again, and I twisted my ankle, and we were still had 10k more to go on a run, my mind could have told me to quit. But I was like, wait, wait, wait. I remember that when I was in a calm situation, I could really logically analyze my situation, I built this mental model. So let me just pull that out of my pocket. This is what I want to do. Cool. Let me do that. And it worked wonders. Does this make sense, guys? Again, I'm going to repeat this. You will not rise to the occasion. You will fall to your lowest level of training. Now, again, this is not just technical stuff. This is the mind stuff, right? I fell in the first unit. I didn't train my mind. I just came there as a cocky 18-year-old, thought I could do it. When I got put in a hard place, I crumpled. Second unit, I was like, that ain't gonna happen again, right? I had a month at home where I was like, I was shamed in front of my family, in front of my friends, and I was like, I don't want to repeat this. So I trained up my mind. I built up all these mental modules so that if something happened, I could fall back on that, and that's what happened. Do we have any questions on this part? Go for it. So with the uh, if then because, would you kind of imagine the situation you're going into and then think of as many ways it could go wrong as possible so you have those or do you keep the right top level just like right when it gets tough off going? Do you think of specifics? So sorry? Scenarios or principles? It's kind of both. The thing is the more scenarios you deal with, the better your understanding of this principle becomes. And also the better your understanding of the principle becomes, the more scenarios you can just kind of wing it by, right? So it starts out by building specific scenarios, and like, I've, again, I've been doing this for years, I've been through a lot, so right now it's like, I don't have to worry about what happens if this and I'm going to collapse. I just don't want to, and that's my decision. It's like if any hardship comes, it is what it is. But again, it took, it took me a while at stages, at the beginning you try to build specific scenarios and go from there, and again, we have three exercises at the end, so I got you, don't worry about it. Any other questions? All right. So, then started the evolution of my mental modules in the next phase of my career. Okay, I want to do something big. I want to go into the Sheen Bet, again, our version of the FBI, CIA, and I wanted to be the youngest person in the history of the country to be accepted and to complete the air marshal program. And I realized that if I just go into it as an amateur, I'm not going to succeed, okay? So the air marshal program is a 10-week course that's only open to ex-special forces. That concludes, one, part of Krav Maga, physical fitness, technical shooting, which basically means how good are you at hitting a target so that it's not moving, just your actual shooting part. And the most challenging part of it, where the most people fail, the most people fall, are the tactical drills. Now, the tactical drills are basically their way of simulating who's gonna be good in the field of battle. So if you're abroad, whether it's on an airplane, whether you're abroad somewhere doing a mission, and you all of a sudden come to a realization that a terrorist attack just happened, there's shootings, there's kidnapping, there's bombs going off, how well are you going to be able to recognize what's going on, analyze it, come up with a game plan, and execute? Okay, that's pretty difficult to do in real time. And the way they would simulate this for us is that they would all take us, they would have this one big room they called the death house, it had many levels in it, and one by one, we would just walk in there like this with our eyes to the floor, they would say look up, and you would just look up, it looked like everybody's just walking around, all of a sudden you hear bop, bop, and it was your time to react and figure everything on the fly, analyze it, 
Strategize, execute. It's pretty hard, right? And again, they created as much chaos as possible. At the beginning of the course, our instructor told us very clearly, guys, it's like, if you just try to wing everything here, you're gonna have a hard time. But if you try to think of as many scenarios as possible and have an answer for them, you can really thrive. And me being the youngest person in the course, I was younger than everyone by seven years. I had to go through all these committees to get in. They were like, you're too young, why should we let you in? And then telling me very specifically, we're looking for you to fail. We're looking to kick you out. Like there was two guys, there was a bad cop and a good cop in the committee. The bad cop was like, I'm looking to kick you out. Like, I don't want you here, I'm looking to kick you out, you're too young. So I knew I had to do something special. So when all the guys, when we were waiting for our turn to the death house, when everyone was hanging out, I was coming up with these if, if, then, because mental models in my head. When all the guys were out at night, after the training, right, they were put in a hotel together, when they were all playing poker, eating pizzas, having beers, I was in my room, working my mind, and trying to get ready and rest up for the next day. I wanted to achieve something extraordinary, I had to take extraordinary measures. And I eventually did graduate the course after 10 weeks, and I also graduated with honors, and I was offered to actually instruct in the Federal Service Compound. And I want to say something like this. So the obstacle I had, I was seven years younger than the next youngest guy there. Everyone there was ex special forces, okay? This, everyone there was elite. And I had to overcome a lot in order to just make it there. And I was told that again, they'll be looking for me to fail, which always gives you a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. It doesn't induce any stress and something good, right? <coughs> so I had to make sacrifices. And again, this is the real part of this, guys. It's like if you want to be elite, sacrifice is involved. I didn't hang out with the guys during off time. They were hanging out and just unwinding from such a stressful course. And I also got a low social score on the sociometry exam. Anybody know what a sociometry exam is? He was in the military. All right, so <laughs> a sociometry exam is basically when they take everybody from the team and they're like, okay, you have to rank this person, like each one of your teammates, according to their honesty, according to their integrity, according to their battleship, like how good of a, of a warrior they are, and also on their social skills. How do they fit into the team? I scored tremendously low on this, okay? I was literally pulled into a committee in the middle of the course, and they were like, Edomar, the guys here are saying you're not a social person. And I was caught off guard. He was like, you guys told me I had to perform at an elite level, so I made a sacrifice because I wanted to become an elite operator. That was my goal here. And then they were like, all right, that makes sense. We can, we can. <laughs> I knew how to talk well, but again, this was like a real sacrifice because out of that 10 week course, where I know a lot of people make friends for life in that course, I didn't come out with any friends. But I did have a lot of friends afterwards in the federal service, and I had a tremendous run there, and I'm so happy I did that. It was payoff. I was the youngest air marshal in the country since year. I did something I'm like, very proud of. This is something that nothing can be taken away from. And it was a big thing, it was a very big challenging thing, and also because it was so challenging, it made it extra sweet. It was also, again, I was approached to teach Krav Maga at the federal compound. So this is a very special thing. Think about that, the amount of agents that got trained in the federal service are about, let's say 150 a year, okay? And there's about 10 instructors in the compound period. And out of all the years, out of all, they came to me and they were like, tomorrow. We want you to instruct you. What do you think about that? And I was like, hey, you know what? Let me be an air marshal. I'm going to fly around the world a little bit, see some cool stuff. But the main thing I want you guys to remember is that I was the first person to get kicked out of even boot camp. Okay, this is the real thing. Like, there's, there's differences to be made here. I was not born this way. I was not born special. I was the first person to be kicked out. The first. Okay? And the first, and I don't know whatever it took the next day. But again, I was the first. So there is a system here, there's things you can use, and that's what I'm hoping you take away with today. No one's born tough. Maybe there are some people that are. I was not. I was not born elite. I had to make effort. And again, I was the first person, guys. Using these systems, using these mental modules, deciding this is what I wanted, this was worth it, this sacrifice was going to be worth it, I chose something pretty cool. Again, guys. You will not rise to the occasion, you will fall to your lowest level of training. I was fortunate enough by age 24 to 
to realize that you know, this is something really, really important and had a big carry over in other places in life. My ability to do this in the Sheen Beck in the Federal Service was tremendously greater than in my first unit, and that's the only reason I succeeded. Point blank, okay? So, who here wants to do a little bit of exercising with this stuff? Wants to try it out themselves? Yeah. Yep. All right, but before we do that, here are the biggest mistakes and how to avoid them about doing this kind of stuff. Mistake number one, people just don't prepare. That's the realness. You know you have something tough ahead of you, you know you have a challenging meeting, a challenging conference, whatever it may be, you know this and you don't prepare for it. Two reasons. One, you're lazy. People are lazy. This is why I'm again, I'm being harsh, I'm being truthful. You do not have to do this, but that's the reality. Some people get really lazy. We'd rather go do something else, we'd rather drink, we'd rather have fun, we'd rather play video games, whatever it may be, like my procrastination is jujitsu. Sometimes I'd rather go train. We all get lazy somehow, and that's the truth. The second thing is fear. Who here has ever put something off because they know it's going to be a really big challenging thing and they're like, I'm not in the mood to deal with this right now. When we get to it, we get to it, and they just get to it unprepared. There you go. This is where I'm going to be very truthful with you guys. If you want to achieve an elite level, while these things are human and they're understandable, they're not acceptable. If you want to achieve the levels you want to achieve, these are not valid excuses. You know why? Because there are no valid excuses. That's what it is. There's reasons, but those are going to be the reasons you fail. Okay? Any questions about this? Anybody want to challenge me on this? Well, I would ask you to really take next to deal with those things. The fear, um, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but the main thing with the fear is just recognizing that every time you do something challenging, like, why did I fear that? You know what I mean? It's like there's, a, there's that example of like your comfort zone, your stretch zone, and your pants zone. So when you start doing things that take you beyond your comfort zone and stretch zone, you start realizing, wait, if I did that, I can do that. I know I'm the kind of person who can overcome. And when you start getting that sense of confidence, it's like a snowball. Does that make sense? So again, I guess this is natural. I don't want to say that just because it's not excusable, it doesn't mean that it's not natural, it's not valid for you to feel that. But it's not valid for you not to want to overcome that. All right? Mistake number two, only looking at technical aspects. So I can have a great game plan. I can have an awesome game plan. But if I think that I'm gonna feel the same way when I'm at the table drawing out my game plan that I'm gonna feel in the field of battle or in the field of business when there's a lot of things on the line, I'm just kidding myself, right? And if I don't take those emotionalities into account, I'm missing out on what's actually going on. So emotional factors will affect our outcomes. And here, you gotta understand what's your default. Do you get overexcited? Do you freeze? Do you get overaggressive? That might just be me. But whatever it is, you're out your default, you gotta figure out how am I most likely to feel in this situation and how will it hinder me? Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. All right. You also wanna create as real a simulation as possible. So you wanna actually visualize this like athletes do. Visualize you going through this mental model that you've created. Don't just say, if this, then because, but actually walk in. If I'm feeling like this and I'm feeling wrecked and I'm tired and I'm anxious and I'm scared, I'm going to suck it up and I'm still going to do this because I'm going to remember that this is where I want to get to in life. Does that make sense? Alright, so exercise number one. Um, there's sheets in the back. You can pass those up. We're going to start off with something really easy, guys, okay? So I'm not going to start you off with an immediate peril of what to do if this or that happens. I want to start you guys off with something very, very easy to show you guys this can also be done for very basic things. So at this conference, some people are introverts, some people are extroverts, right? There's somebody here that you might want to engage. Or you just say, you know what, I want to participate more in conversations. When a conversation arises, I want to participate, I want to say something, I have something of value to share, or you might tell yourself when a conversation starts, I actually want to pull back a little bit and open up my ears. So I want you to think about a situation in the conference. When you're engaging with someone at the conference, 
that you know you're going to regret if you just stay in there and then be like, ah, oh, man, I should have said that or I should have asked that. Something very easy, right? And I have a question about this. All right, guys, so just a little bit of a cue on this. It's like, I wrote this for myself. So it's challenging to be authentic and vulnerable at these conferences. All right, this might be something you want to do. It might be your if, then because. And again, the, it requires a calm courage to approach someone you admire and connect with them. So we shy away from that a lot of times. So again, guys, try to think of one situation. I'll give you guys a couple minutes, and we'll run through with one of the people of what they want to do. That sound good? I'm here if you have any questions. Do we have any brave volunteers here that are willing to share their rental module with us? Any brave volunteers? Thank you, man. You want to stand up? No worries. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Go for it. Right, okay, so my because is I want I want to get some knowledge from that person I've identified. The if situation is um, if I see a person that I've identified as someone who can help me in my situation. And then the then is I need to approach the person and introduce myself in a confident, polite, and warm way. Nice. So what are the emotions that might block you though from doing that? Well, it's not really emotions, but I realize I'm not playing the war. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, that comes down to being insecure, I guess, and worried about criticism, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Guys, give me a hand. <laughs> All right, so we have, I want to open this up for Q&A as well, because I know you guys might have questions also about various different other <laughs> lessons and tactics and whatever it may be. So I'm going to give you a choice. You can choose either a scenario about personal safety. You're all traveling across the world. You all make bad decisions when you're drunk at 2 a.m. and you say, you know what, <laughs> let me take this shortcut instead of going the long way around, even though the shortcut's dangerous. When you're going through that shortcut and you see somebody coming at you and you're drunk, you're not going to make a good decision. Like, you know what, let me walk away when he's 50 meters away from me and go back to the safe place. You're like, ah, it'll be okay, I'll figure it out. But if you would have thought about that when you were in the right frame of mind, you would say to yourself, okay, you know what? I'm gonna go drinking today. I'm lazy, I'm lazy by the way, I'm gonna take a shortcut. But if this happens, if I see something that might endanger me, then I will retract my steps, go back the other way, because my safety is important to me. All right, that's one option. You guys can try to do that now. Or the second option is for your business. If you have a crisis, if you have something even smaller than that, you know that on sales calls, people push you sometimes, and in the heat of the sales call, you kind of give in when the client asks for something extra, or complaints, or whatever it may be. If you have a pitch you want to do, so again guys, this is your choice. I'll let you go at it. I am here, please raise your hand if you have any questions, you want any help. This is why I'm here, I'm here for you guys, I'm here to serve you, please let me do that. All right? Yeah, it's a question on step four, right? Yeah. Um, like if it's the case that doesn't, like, it doesn't require emotions, something like, for example, the situation I came up with the last one was um, whether I'm mindful or not, which isn't really an emotion, what? whether I'm being mindful or not, and uh, that's really the barrier, is like not being mindful of what I'm saying or thinking. Uh, like, how do you integrate that into the model? So this is kind of your tendency. You're not being mindful and being so focused on whatever it may be, this is your tendency. When we say like some people get some people freeze, some people get stressed, some people get over aggressive, whatever it may be, your tendency is to kind of be mindful, to not be mindful, sorry. Right. So realize that this is my my tendency, this is what's gonna happen to me naturally, how do I override that? What emotion do I have to feel like okay right I wanna be giving right now? So it's the emotion that would stop me from overriding that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> when you're using the model, do you, the way you were using it, you were setting up positive scenarios. Yes. Right? However, the mind tends to want to know what the negative circumstances are of scenarios. So do you ever use it on that side to, you know, if, if I do this, then that'll happen. Because, so you're kind of going through the negative 
Yeah, so the like, thing about it is like you're having this one big mental module and there's a little cut off there. Right. So like if this happens and I start going off track, how do I bring myself off track? Like back to the track. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean basically, you know, using positive reinforcement over the actuality of what could actually happen. No, so uh, yeah. you, there's no positive reinforcement. Like, just to clarify, this is actions. This is what actions I want to take. So if negative things happen, what action am I going exactly. to take? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 so just to clarify in case I wasn't clear, it's like the positive reinforcement stuff, like it's great. I'm not saying anything against that, but this is not what this is about. This is about action. Okay? So really focus on the actions here. It's not I will try to manifest that the weeds won't grow or anything like that. This is like what actual action I'm going to be taking to ensure success. Yeah, the action might be a decision, it might be a physical action, whatever it might be. Do, like, if you go through this process and you have like if then because, and then you think about the emotional honest assessment and you think about those emotions and you think, well, fuck, that still might stop me. Even though I've done this process, I know this emotion might stop me from moving through. So let me ask you this: like you crossfit, right? Yeah. If you hit a bar, you can't lift. Go at it again. Go at it again. Go at it again. Go at it again. You start figuring out. Like, the emotions subside the more times you go through them. Public speaking, what you just did beforehand. Like maybe your first time, you're like, man, this was hard. You get better and you get better and you get better. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah, it just reps. It's reps and your lowest level of training. Right. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, why are you comparing all this? Like for the conference today, we go back in time and say, well, here's all the shit that made me anxious. I'm going to write down if, if, then, because. Like, what are you doing this? So, this is a really good question. I'll put it like this. So when you're trying to analyze the situation, this is how we conduct risk assessments, right? We're trying to figure out what's the thing that's going to endanger us the most. And it's maybe your personal life, business, whatever it may be. The way you comprise that is made out of three things. How you comprise danger. The immediacy of the threat. Think of this a conference today or in a year from now. The probability it's going to happen. Is this actually likely? Is it unlikely? Say in business. You know what I mean? It's like, this is something that's probable to happen or not probable. And the last thing is the magnitude of possible harm. So how much damage could this inflict on you missing this opportunity at the conference? And is it worth your attention? Or is this whatever? Same thing in your business. Would it give you a headache for a couple minutes writing back some emails? Or is this a situation that can bankrupt your business? So you take those three things into account, and then you tally up what's important to you. So yes, the night before, whatever it may be. So like, my thing is I'm prepared. I am prepared. Like I will sacrifice time doing things that most people want to do because I want to be prepared. I want to reach an elite level. Like right now, I've just been in DC a year. I recognize that I'm here, so I got to prepare harder than everybody, and I got to make that effort to be elite. So I sacrifice, and that really is up to you. Like what level you want to take it to. I, I got a question on that. Yeah. One. So when you sort of uh, to sacrifice evenings, you know, drinking in order to achieve yeah. your goal. Um, do you have that thought about like how much can I actually do to achieve my goal while still you know enjoying some evening with some people? You know, it's like at what point do I actually balance on something and may I not regret effectively having created some friendship and some bonding? So, so that's a very personal question. Yeah. And it really depends on your goals. Like they're just saying that like in running they say like you very rarely regret the runs you do and you usually regret the runs you don't do. And it's a balancing act. Like again, I was very lonely for a long time there. Also, when I went to train jujitsu, like, that was all the things that I was doing. It's a balancing. It's a tier tolerance. Like, that you're gonna have to find your balance of where you really want to go to, how important it is to you, and how valid it is for you. And again, it's your stage. Like I, I just said, I'm at the stage right here right now. So I don't have the privilege of not making sacrifices. Maybe in a couple of years down the road, I can enjoy the fruits of my labor. But right now, I got labor. So it's really up to you. Does that make sense? That's it. Yes? Do you think getting into a habit of this can lead you to just overanalyze your entire life all the time? Yeah. Because <laughs> 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 especially as entrepreneurs, we have like analysis paralysis is so like a normal thing. Okay, so again, think about the th like, um, a man over there had a productivity talk yesterday. And he was like, think about your three most important things, your three most important tasks, right? 
kind of think, think about the three most probable things, the biggest outcome things that could affect you. Try to leave them to that. Don't just go everywhere and anywhere. And again, once you have these big overarching things, you'll be able to say, okay, this is just something similar to that. So I can place it into that module and kind of use it to go off that. Make sense? Yeah. If you guys do not, let's just run through this and then we'll open to like full on QA. Okay, does anybody want to share this with everyone? I need a brave soul in the audience, the second brave soul. Thank you. So I chose personal safety. Yep. So the because is because then you stay out of trouble, especially in a poor country. So if I'm presented with a challenge for my safety, I'm ripped off, I'm assaulted, I need to swallow my ego, my pride, and avoid confrontation. These challenges are that I'm naturally confrontational when I'm presented with these situations, and I tend to take things personal. That's good stuff, guys. Give me my hand. That's absolutely great. personal safety is that we're not willing to like just say, okay, this is the loss that I have to take. I'd rather lose a hundred bucks than to have someone try to stab me, right? And if we don't keep our egos in check, that very quickly happens. So it's a great mental model, man. Appreciate it. Thank you for sharing. All right, so let's move on a little bit. What can you do to take action on this stuff now? First thing. What we're talking about, you gotta decide if you want to be elite in whatever you're pursuing. It's a decision, it requires sacrifice. You have to make a proper, well-educated decision, give it some thought, say you're willing to put in that grind. You're willing to put in that effort to get to where you wanna go, all right? Second thing, recognize the onset of stress as a signal that you need to build a mental module or pull one out, okay? Start looking for this as a trigger. Start something, how do I get stressed? What happens to me when I get stressed? When I get stressed, I start getting a little jittery. So wait, I'm getting a little jittery? It must mean I'm being stressed. Let me figure out what I need to do on this room. Let me take a step back. Let me take a couple deep breaths and calm myself down. Make sense? The last thing I want you guys to remember, you will not rise to the occasion. You will fall to your lowest level of training, but your lowest level of training can be amazing and you guys can be elite. Like if you're in this room, you're an intelligent person today, you came to the DC, the second you came to my talk, so your level of error. <laughs> but really, like, you can make this lowest level of training something that will smash your competitors on their best day. All right, so let's open for Q&A, guys. What kind of agency? So, uh, you do Facebook and Instagram ads for various kinds of things. You had a question. Yeah. First of all, great talk. I mean, thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, my question was in regards to your reflection point of failing in boot camp. When you shared that story, I immediately thought of one of my own you know, regrets back in time. And I don't often share it, but I often revisit it as uh, like the furthest point where I don't want to be. Yeah. Right. And then I say, okay, it's my, it's my decision right now. Will that lead me closer to that point? Yeah. Is, is that something you can share your experiences with? So the way I've kind of started, first off, thank you for sharing. And my route of kind of developing mental fortitude was through regret of that kind of thing. When it started first, it was analyzing the past. So, dude, I just quit and I got kicked out. I got embarrassed in front of everyone. I don't want to relive this anymore. So next time if I face a situation like that, challenging, running, and all that, I'm going to overcome that. Next phase. This is really hard, and I'm starting to feel like my mind is starting to quit on me. Is this somewhere I want to go? This is that onset of stress. Do I want to take the route back to quitting, or do I maybe want to overcome and take the harder path in life? So I started to realize things were like in real time. And last, I got to this place where something like is about to be hard. I'm like, all right, now I'm excited. This is where I can shine, this is where I can create separation. So it's really about that, and that was kind of my journey. It's like, I regretted it, but I used that as fuel to keep going up the levels. So I don't look back at it a lot nowadays, because it's helped me transform my personality a little bit. Now obviously I still mess up, I still fail, I still don't work as hard as I do sometimes, but that's what I decided to define myself as, someone who just goes for it. Make sense? Makes sense. Any other questions, guys? How do you 
because I get that in a business sense you decide that by back a trillion dollars that will be successful or yes, happiness. And then you commit yourself to that and you devote yourself to that task and then you get there and you realize, oh shit, that was actually wrong, how come I shouldn't have been sacrificing to do that? So just to kind of take a step above this stuff, how do you figure out what those outcomes are? So that's a great question. It's a hard question, it's something we're all going to have to basically figure out in our lives. So, to answer your question really quickly, it's like, it's up to you. It's up to you to kind of understand this. But I think this is also a great opportunity to share something from my personal story. It's like I was like shoulder hip to hip, as we call it, with a billionaire for three years. I went to all the fanciest places in the world, to St. Bart's, to Cala de Volpe, to anywhere and everywhere you can imagine, to Monaco. People there are fucking miserable. <laughs> I'm being dead honest, like people there are just miserable. They have achieved or gotten something or whatever it could be, and they just don't do anything with it. And people there are miserable. It's it's like it just it was such an amazing lesson for me to realize that's not potential. It's like I think Tony Robbins spits that fire, he's got truth in what he says that like growth is happiness. And again, growth doesn't just have to be physical. Like my mission right now is to be a great business, be an amazing husband to my now fiance. I got different missions that put me different places in life. It's up to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're pretty. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, you're a pretty intense guy and uh, talk a lot about action. Like, maybe could you tell us in this elite position, uh, did you learn anything about, or is there any practice that you um, do in terms of stillness, bringing yourself down and not being in that action mode all the time? Yes. Do you have any practice that you can <laughs> Um, all right, so we all want to succeed, right? So we have business mentors, we have business coaches, whatever it may be. It's like, I recognize what my mental defaults are, and I had someone help me with my mind. I have to see a, therapist, a psychotherapist for a while. She realized how I can make me a little bit more whole, a little bit more complete, and I can be calmer when I need to be, and not just try to aggressively bulldoze everything in life. And that was a big thing for me be able to calm down and realize what do I actually want to achieve, what's the kind of person I want to become, and let me try to find this thing out. Does that make sense? So like now I still, I meditate a little bit, I do yoga, but I try every day to start my day and say like, what do I actually want to be? Who do I want to be? I know I have my defaults that will take over at some point, but if I bring it back to this point of equation, right, who I want to be, it really helps me. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. What's your model for balancing business between doing Cool, fun shit like jujitsu, ice baths, meditating, hiking mountains. Realist? It's like I'm, I don't have that great of balance. It's like right now, again, I'm not at a place where I can afford to be balanced. In my eyes, I'm starting out and I want to be elite. It requires sacrifice. It's like I still train three, four times a day, three, sorry, six times a week. <laughs> but I also try to fast things. So when I wake up, I do my yoga immediately. It starts my day off good. And then I go train and I go to open mat and I just get all my testosterone out, right? And the thing is, I really tried to be 20 analyze. What are the things that truly brought me happiness in life? What is it worthwhile spending my attention? It's like, so it's also like the point of diminishing returns, right? It's just like in business, but also in social life. So I realized that, okay, if I go out every night of the week, it's nice, but it's also great to go out two nights of the week. And I get that like social feel for myself. So I try to analyze where's that dipping point of the 80-20 diminishing returns so I can focus more on time and energy to my business. So you do like a, a regular eight hours per day or? Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping to learn some cool stuff and get shit done yeah. in like a week or so. But yeah, right now that's what I do. I do eight hours on my off days. Any set relationship time with your fiance? Or? Yeah, seven o'clock screens are off. Seven o'clock screens are off. She gets my full attention. Weekends? No work. <laughs> work. Work. No weekends. <laughs> like, my weekend is that like on Sunday, I go to open mat, I train hard, I go have dinner with, I go have lunch with a good friend over here, and then I get back to it. But again, I'm at that place. You guys might be at a very different place in your life. You don't have to make this rush because you've already put more years, more effort, more reps into it. It's where I'm at. Yeah, like that three, that 1,000 day rule. 1,000 hours. What's that no 1,000 day rule? That uh, Dan Andrews, they yeah. said like, that's how long it's gonna take you to recuperate your income? 
I was like, all right, challenge accepted. <laughs> that's what I heard that, that's what I thought. So I find your method really good for like one of difficult uh, situations. Do you apply the same logic to building habits? Yes, because again, habits like that you don't do, it's the same thing. They're going to cause you to regret. You're going to feel bad about yourself. You're going to look at the man in the mirror and say, why did I work out today? Why did I work on my business today? Whatever it may be. And you're going to say, wait, I didn't like that. I don't like how I feel about myself. I didn't put in that effort. So if this happens again, so then I will do this. Because regret's a big part. Like embrace regret, guys. Regret, like if you know how to take regret into a positive place and use it as fuel, it can take you to amazing places. Right, I'm being told that I have to wrap up, guys. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate being able to share something with you.